Mark chapter 6, verse 30 and 32, as I'm going to use as kind of the, the tee shot to hit us down the middle of the fairway today. It says this, it says, the apostles gathered around Jesus reported to him all that they had done and taught. Then because so many people were coming and going, they did not even get a chance to eat. He said to them, I wonder what Jesus' voice sounded like in this moment. Sometimes we read the scripture and we don't have a person and a voice to it. When you read the scripture, what's the voice of God sound like? What's the voice of Jesus sound like? I am enamored with the laugh of Jesus. I think I heard it earlier today. I think I heard it last night as Pastor Adam was, was preaching. I, I do. I, in my spirit, I heard the laughter of Jesus. I can't wait to get to heaven to hear what I've already heard. I... I can't. So when you read the words of Jesus, do you hear a voice? He's in you. Don't make it be a nameless, faceless narrator. No, it's a personal Savior who's in this moment with you. And he's speaking to his disciples. He sees how hard they've been working. He sees the lack that they're walking in. He sees that they're hungry. He sees that they're tired. And he speaks over them. I wonder what the tone of his voice is. That's the tone of our Savior speaking over you today. He sees you. He sees you in this moment. And he's speaking. And what does he speak? He doesn't just speak platitudes or principles. No, he says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place. And get some rest. I wonder if that's what the disciples were expecting. They just came back from being sent out, you know, two by two, kind of the Noah's Ark thing. And, and they came back. And they'd just been ministering, and casting out demons, and healing people, and ministering in his name. And they come back to Jesus and they're tired, they're hungry, they're exhausted. And he says, hey, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Last night, Pastor Adams, he preached, never let it rest. This is gonna be a two-part sermon series we're tag teaming on. Because the title I want for this second half of our tag team is, I need some rest. Say, I, say, say, I need some rest. Now pick your favorite person in the room, you only get one, and look at them and say, I need some rest. Thank you, music man, I appreciate your help. You guys can have a seat. You guys can have a seat. I love this story. You got the disciples who have been out ministering in Jesus' name, casting out demons. They're doing ministry. They're leading deacon meetings, running outreach things. They're doing all the work. And then they come back to Jesus, and they're now reporting to him like giddy little school kids. Jesus, we drove out a demon. And he's like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> we healed a deaf ear. He's like, that's pretty neat. And I, in, my, in, in my heart, when I picture this story, I'm picturing being like my 18-year-old who comes home like, Dad, I'm so tired. <laughs> and I laugh. I'm like, boy, you're 18. <laughs> you don't know what tired is. <laughs> I think sometimes Jesus is laughing at us going, yeah, you're tired. <laughs> And he says, let's go get some rest. Let's go to a quiet place, a solitary place by ourselves to get some rest. What a cool, cool picture that Jesus says, all right, First Baptist of Capernaum, you know, let's, Pastor Jesus is going to take his lead team over to Ark Jerusalem. So we're just going to, you know, get on the boat and go to Ark and we're going to get some rest. And some of you saw this as a place in the distance. Like, if I can just get to Art Canada, I'm going to get some, If I can just get there, I'm going to get some rest. But as they're going across the lake, I wonder what they pictured was waiting for them on the other side. So when Jesus says, let's go by ourselves to a quiet place and let's get some rest, they framed a picture in their head of what was waiting for them on the other side. What do you think they saw? I'm picturing like a B&B. &B. We're going to get like a Manny Petty. This is going to be amazing. I'm going to put my feet up in the hammock. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for giving me a vacation. 
That's, I think in my heart, that's what they're picturing. Because if I tell you, let's go buy ourselves to a quiet place to get some rest, you're like, thank you, LB, I'm getting on the bus. Because I need some rest. Jesus saw what they needed, but he was not going to give them what they wanted. And as they get on this boat, they're headed to the other side. And in verse 33 of Mark 6, it continues. It says, but many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them. Question, Jesus had compassion. What did the disciples have? Contempt. They're like, I'm hungry. I am tired. What's up with this? And Jesus is going to start preaching? I thought we were going to get a vacation. This is not what I thought it would be, Jesus. So he starts preaching to them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day. So his disciples came to him. I think this is Peter. I think G Peter's the one who's appointed by the other disciples to be the one to deliver the news and listen to the cadence of what Peter is about to communicate on behalf of the disciples. It sounds so nice. But it's not. It's actually hiding an offense in the language he's using. And we become really good in church to hide offense in Christianese. And we learn how to blame God for our disobedience. I just feel like the Lord is leading me. No, you suck. That's what, I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't say that. Like, that was the line, huh? By this time, it was late in the day. This is a remote place. They said, I think Peter said, this is a remote place. It's very late. So they began to send. So send them away. Come on, Jesus, so they can go to countrysides and villages and buy themselves something. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. But what do you do with when what you've been picturing is not what you're seeing? Think about the disappointment of the disciples. They're tired, they're hungry, they're exhausted. They haven't eaten. And now Jesus says, let's go buy ourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. That, does any of you, do any of you think that's rest? So was Jesus lying to them? No, Jesus is truth. It is incompatible with his nature to lie. He is truth. So was he lying to them? Or did he just not know the whole crowd was gonna be there? Yes, he did, because he's at the same time fully God, and he's omnipotent. He knows that's waiting for them. So if he's li not lying, and he knows it's waiting for them, what's going on? Here's what I see happen in ministry. The word tired has become like an Enneagram type. It, it, is, it, is, it is like a blood type. And now when I'm talking to people, like, I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm like, I, oh, my gosh, like, we're starting there? That, that's where the whole thing is going to be. Like, I'm tired. Like, I'll sound it real southern. I'm tired, y'all. I'm tired. And what I see happening as a result of that is people coming up and saying, I just really need to have some healthy boundaries. And I feel like I really need to protect my time and my family from the church. And what I see happening in the kingdom is people worshiping self. I need to protect myself from the, anything that tries to separate you from the body of Christ is evil and is from the pit of hell. That is not God. That is not God. I am an extreme person. I live in extremes. I did not come to be a cosmetologist to make you look good. I came to be a proctologist to inspect and make sure you are good. We are about to crawl up in it because God says we got to look at it. That's where we're going. And we, 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 we have an entire, we have got a false spirit that is active in the church and we are unaware of it. And we're living in a world where people are telling you, I need boundaries. And what they're meaning is, here's the, here's the picture. 
here's what I thought it's going to look like on the other side of the lake. So the boundaries I need are the ones that make the outcome that's desirable happen to me. That's what people are looking for when they say, I need some boundaries. I would submit to you, you do need some boundaries. Not to protect the ch you from the church, but to protect the church from you. And so boundaries to protect you from yourself. That's what we're going to talk about for a few minutes. And I think we're living in this world where I'm just tired, so I need some boundaries, and that's my day off. And I get it. I'm not talking about, use your vacation days. But I'm talking about a spirit that does not submit to the kingdom, but rather it borrows the theology of the world. And it reduces the calling down to a preferential outcome. And I will manipulate circumstances and situations to get the picture that I desire on the other side of the lake. And if it doesn't line up with the picture I thought would look like over there, I don't think that's what God wants. And I'm tired of people talking about church hurt. The church didn't hurt you. Bob hurt you. Bob's a jerk. The church didn't hurt you. Oh, but anybody who wants to be used mightily will be wounded greatly, as A.W. Tozer said. Yes, he does want to wound you. Maybe he wants to have you walk with a limp. But when you create boundaries that never let yourself get exposed to struggle, you will never experience the fruit that God wants to produce through your life. So that's what I want to jump into for just a second. And the first boundary that I want to give you is to upgrade your definition. Here's what I think is happening in this scenario. They are both using the word rest, but they got a very different definition of it. Okay, so if I rewind to Mark chapter 1, verse 12, Jesus just gets baptized, beautiful picture of the Trinity, and it says he was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness. You know, the wilderness, that desolate place, the desperate, the, the desert, that place. The word used for wilderness in, in chapter 1 is the same word that's used for a quiet place in a solitary place in chapter 6. What you and I, how did Holy Spirit, how would people hear this? What you and I call wilderness is what Jesus calls purpose. And Jesus is saying, I'm taking you to the wilderness because it's only in the wilderness where you will find purpose. That's where you find rest. Not the kind of rest that a good nap takes care of. I'm talking about rest for your soul that connects itself and re-engages with purpose. We are living in a purposeless place. You never discover more purpose by sleeping longer or having seven day weekends. That does not engage you with purpose. I'm tired. How about you upgrade your definition. How do you define rest? I wonder if Jesus has the same definition. Because he and the disciples had very different definitions. I, I was doing some marital counseling. This is six or eight months ago. And, and a couple come in and they just said, we just don't communicate well. And I said, well, the wife, what, what do you tell me? Well, you know, he just does not come home and share the deep, intimate things of his life. And I never know how he's emotionally feeling at any time. I just want to deeply connect with his emotions. That's her definition of communication. His was, I think we just need to have more sex. <laughs> We're using the same word, but very different definition. Some of you have a word calling, and it's not God's definition. Some, some of you have, have, have a definition for struggle, and it's a very different definition than what God has. Here's the key. Frustration is an indication of an upgrade in definition. I challenge you to look at the areas of your life where frustration is setting in. And it's an opportunity to upgrade your definition. Holy Spirit, show them right now the frustration that they have. Some of you have not used your fingers or your pen. Use it right now. Because if you do not capture the word God wants to bring, you will forget it. And he's revealing something to you. You want to stop being tired? Start changing your definition of what rest is. Thank you. And here's the thing. Jesus, he takes the disciples. He sees all of the people. And he has compassion 
the disciples got contempt. They're like, Jesus, you, you lied to us, man. You told us we were going to get rest. I was expecting B and B. What is going on here? And Jesus starts preaching to them. Here's the thing. When you look at the word wilderness, when we get a better, better definition of how God defines these things, the wilderness is a place or a people that's been deserted. Ooh. Jesus took the disciples to the wilderness to show them the wilderness. And Jesus is the only one in the moment that sees the wilderness. It's the people without a shepherd. And that's why he has compassion. Because he understands his purpose is the people that are in the wilderness. The disciples completely missed it. Why? Because they had a different definition and a different expectation. But what do I do when life does not look like what I thought it would? Some of you are sitting next to somebody and you didn't expect the marriage to look like this. Looking at a church that you didn't expect it to look like this. And rather than change the definition, you withdraw from it because you don't think there's purpose in it. And some of you silently quit just one little step at a time. And you slowly lower the level of your expectation to the level of your experience because you no longer want to be disciplined. What is the word that the Holy Spirit just showed you that you need to redefine? I need to upgrade my definition. You say we're sheep without a shepherd. And the story continues. In, in, in verse 45. Because you know the story. You were so familiar with this. Feeds the 5,000. They picked up da, da, da. Okay. You didn't, you didn't see this last part. Jump into... Verse 45, it says, later that night. So Jesus, they get done. Jesus like, all right, boys, get back on the boat. Go back to the other side. I wonder what their attitude was while they're hopping back into the boat. Okay. And he said, later that night, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was on the land. What did the sound of that boat, what was going on in that boat? What did it sound like? I wonder if it sounded like a deacon meeting or an elder meeting. I wonder if it sounded like a, a, a prayer meeting where we're just going to get together and pray, which is code for we're going to criticize and complain. They are on the boat like, you freaking kidding me? I think Peter's the loudest one. Are you kidding me? Oh, if I thought they all ate and we did all the work and then you put us back in, and you're going to go up on the mountain and just sit up there and pray by yourself, Jesus. Absolutely, that's exactly where their spirit was because it's your spirit and it's mine when what we believe it should look like doesn't line up with what it is. In that space is where we capture this story here. They get back in the boat. They're going to the other side. He saw the disciples straining at the oars. It indicates us doing stuff in our own strength and in our own power, and it's fueled by our own complaining and our own whining and our own grumbling. It should have been a two-hour trip across the lake. They would have gotten in the boat about 9 p.m. Jesus is going to show up at about 6 a.m. They should have been over the lake many hours ago, but they're only one hour into nine hours of work. I wonder if that speaks to some of us as how we try to plant a church and lead. I wonder if the ground that we should be covering isn't being covered because we're silently holding on to things that Jesus says you should not be holding on to that. So Jesus... He saw them because of the wind. Shortly before dawn, he went out to them walking by. He knew what they were saying on the boat, and he was about to pass them by. But when they saw him by, walking by in the lake, they thought it was a ghost. They cried out because they said, they, they, they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them, take courage, don't be afraid. Then he climbed in the boat with them. He climbed in the boat when you're complaining. He climbed in the boat when you don't want to do it anymore. He climbed in the boat with your bad attitude, with your crappy attitude showing up. He still got in the boat with all of their criticism and complaining. He still did it. Why do I know their complaints? They're like, well, that doesn't say that in the text. Like, Then he climbed in the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed. For they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened, meaning they were offended. Second boundary I would want us to consider is to face your offense. Face your offense. You will forfeit more territory than the devil will ever steal. Offense is caustic in the calling of a Christian. It is so caustic. And you know what's even worse than that? Secondhand offense. 
when my wife and I helped start Elevation Church 18 years ago, I looked at my wife and said, I will never come home and complain about Pastor Stephen or Chunks, our CFO. You'll never hear me say a negative word about them. Why? Because I don't want her to hate what we love. And what some of you do, it's so dysfunctional. You don't know how to deal with the offense. So you come home and you vomit on your spouse. They're covered in puke and they hate the pastor they had no conversation with. Secondhand offense is corrosive and it is picking people off in the kingdom. It is so corrosive. There is a syndrome that I'm reading about. It's called ODS, offended disciple syndrome. This is a, you would not expect, have you ever heard this part of the story? Feed the 5,000, God will multiply it. And the people that the, that the hands that the bread passed through are offended at the one who, who broke it. Why? Because it does not look like what I thought it was going to be. I was here to get mine. I didn't get mine. And they all got theirs. And now I'm offended. And now this shouldn't be taking this long. Why is it so hard rowing this boat? An offense is killing you. And how do you build a boundary that does not let yourself be offended? People that are easily offended will not be used mightily. Holy Spirit, reveal to us those that... Let me say it differently. We are all offended. It's a matter of what you do with it. And here, face your offense. And when we get to this place, the response from somebody who's been pierced in their heart is one of repentance. One who's just like, that's cool. We just go on to the next thing. And you carry offense into the next scene. And you wonder why the next scene can't be blessed is because you carried offense into it with you. Some of you, the conversation, the action step that God wants you to have is to go to your pastor immediately after this and say, I repent. I have not submitted to your authority because I doubted your leadership. I thought I was smarter than you. Some of you left a church and you could have had very good reasons to leave, but yet you left offended. Offended is a choice. It's not an event. It is a choice. It is a willful volition for you to be led by your flesh and not led by the spirit. It is choosing to submit to your flesh, not the spirit of God. One of the, here's the reality. When I look back, Jesus says to Peter, hey, you feed them, Peter. Peter's like, I got nothing to feed them. Why? Because his hands were full of offense. He was incapable of feeding at that point because his hands were filled with offense. When I'm holding on to offense, I can never give a blessing. You, you, that's why Peter couldn't feed him. It wasn't because he lacked physical provision. It's because he did not submit spiritually and he chose to feed his flesh. One of the disciplines that I've started employing about six months ago is every night I do what I call pick the fruit and pluck the weed. It's the greatest discipline for me that I've put into my life my whole life because I believe in the power of specificity. So at the end of the night, rather than like, I'm just grateful. Well, what are you grateful for? <laughs> oh, grateful. Oh, man, when I had that chance to talk to my friend Nate today and he spoke life over me, I wrote that down last night. And I wrote down like this man who spoke into my life is, God, thank you for that kind of friendship. The power of specificity. Some of us are so general in our celebration, but specific in our criticism. That's an offended spirit. That is an offended spirit. I call you to repent. That's an offended spirit. You are so, you're so awesome, but here are 32 things you need to do differently. That's an offended spirit because there is no grace because the hardness of their heart will not let that seed plant in the soil of their heart. Holy Spirit, be surgical with us right now. Be surgical with us. And I pray that you would not shut down and let shame wash over you. Respond with gratitude saying, thank you for speaking to me. Thank you for showing me this Holy Spirit. Thank you for revealing this to me. So I need to pick the fruit. I go back through my schedule and I say, there was fruit from my day. How's your day today? It was horrible. No, it was not. Stop it. Freaking spiritually immature four-year-old, knock it off. Fine. Just, that's me. Power of specificity. Pick the fruit. Pluck the weed. I keep an offense journal. 
It's not a record of wrongs of like, ha it's five more points on them. That's not what I'm, keep no record of wrongs, the scripture says. That's not what I'm talking about. What it is, it's reflecting back, saying, Holy Spirit, where did I get offended today? And now I got to submit that to the Holy Spirit. Why did I get offended with that? They didn't notice me. I didn't get that seat. Nobody looked at me. Nobody honored me. Those silent offenses that got unaddressed are seeds that are sown in the soil of your heart. And they will produce and they will continue to flourish until you pluck the weed. It is so much easier to pluck a weed than cut down a tree. Tend the soil of your heart. You want a boundary? Be hard to offend. This is, I command you, child of God. We have adulterated what boundaries should be. I need to protect myself and just knock it off. No, I need to protect the church from me, my offended spirit. I pray that there be such conversations tonight where our vulnerability happens and like, I'm easily offended. I am, would I, here's the reality, as I have done this offense journal, I realize how prideful I am. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't think my opinion matters. <laughs> ah! And if people don't want to hear my opinion, I get offended. Some of, if you want something to die, you need to starve it. Some of you need to go on a 21-day opinion fast. No one has ever been won to the gospel by your opinion. No one has ever been redeemed from the pit of hell by your opinion. And yet you are so addicted to your opinion. It is visceral. And if people don't see it, you're like, oh! That's an offended spirit. Will you submit that to the Holy Spirit? And then Jesus would say to his disciples in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. And he said, he said to all, he said, if anyone would come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily. Daily and follow me. I wonder if Peter would remember those words a little bit later in Luke. It, when, when Jesus would say this specifically to Luke in, verse 20, in chapter 22. He said, Simon, Simon. He's Simon and he's Peter. You know, the, when the offended part of you shows up, that's Simon. But when the part that shows up that's submitted to the Holy Spirit, that's Peter. And you got both of them in you. I got Larry and I got Lawrence. I got, it's all in here. Oh, they didn't like me. They didn't, they didn't, I didn't get as many likes. Simon, Simon. But the beauty of the repetition in the scripture, it's a Hebrew term of intimacy. It's intended to be spoken at a whisper, which means he's close. I know what you're gonna do, Peter, and I'm still right here. And when I understand that the offense that Peter carried from Mark 6 helps me under, understand his spiritual blindness through all of Mark. Because an offended heart will never see the things of God. He walked the whole journey, but yet he still could not see it because the offense didn't allow him to. Some of you are sitting in a seat that miracles are going on all around you, but you're not seeing him because your heart is offended. And he says to him, he says, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I prayed for you, Simon, that you, your faith may not fail. At that point, you're like, oh, I got Jesus personally praying for me. I'm good. No. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. It means feed your brothers. But he replied, Lord, you know I'm ready to go to prison and to death, Jesus answered. But I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Here's the third boundary that we need to establish for anybody who sinks kingdom influence is to deny yourself. L let me go on a little bit of a sidebar here. We are living in a world that's worshiping self-care. Self-care is a false doctrine that the church has adopted. And you cannot live by the philosophy of the world and, spend, and expect a kingdom outcome. What we have done, I put self-care in the same bucket of inclusivity. 
on first blush, it sounds great. Absolutely the church, we're for everybody. Oh, but you've got a different definition of that word than I do. We have not just borrowed the language of the world, but we've borrowed the definition of the world. And it's insulting to God. We have borrowed the philosophy of the world and we're trying to build kingdom on it. Anytime somebody wants to overthrow a nation, they dilute the language. If you want to overthrow the kingdom, dilute the language. And we dilute the language about what words mean that we have understood historically from the beginning of time. And yet we're trying to redefine the language. Deny yourself it means to stop feeding yourself. Stop feeding yourself deprec deprecation. Stop feeding your greed and your anger. Stop feeding your insecurity. Start, stop uh, assuming the worst about others. Deny those lustful thoughts. Deny the gossip and the slander. But to deny yourself. I looked at on Instagram. 84 million tags for self-care. 11,000 for self-denial. I have searched this book cover to cover. It does not talk about self-care. It talks about self-denial. Let us restore the right boundaries. The right boundaries. Self-denial. Denial. What self-denial is means whatever is on the throne of your heart is what you worship. Self-care puts ourselves at the center of the whole thing, and we are worshiping ourselves. It is idolatry. It is not of God. I'm not talking about the spirit of self-care. Take your vacations. Don't take me out of context. I'm talking about worshiping self and your own desired outcomes, not the glory of God. And now at the end, it just... Oh, I'm taking a Nate here for just a second. <laughs> Stand to your feet. This will help me end it. You know the story. Peter denies Jesus three times. Because you will either deny Jesus or you will deny yourself. Daily. Hourly. Minute by minute. I will either deny you or I'll deny me. Both of them lead to very different roads. Every time self-care is put at the center of that decision, you generally deny Christ because you will always be about self-preservation. Well, I'm being, I don't want to be burned out. We're called to be poured out as a drink offering, completely empty, completely unbroken, just completely but Jesus shows back up on the scene in John chapter 21. You know the story. He shows up back up to Peter and he's gonna, he's gonna reinstate him. He went back to fishing because it didn't work out like I thought it would. And some of you are looking at a picture of that was not the preferred outcome and you think that it is the end of the story. It is not. But you gotta start by changing your definition. When they finished eating, Jesus said, to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says, do you love me? He uses the word agape. Do you love me like your savior? Peter responds, you know that I phileo you. I love you like my brother. Same word, different definition. Jesus is gonna ask Peter three times. Yes, it's for each of the denials, but I think there's something so much deeper here. I think because the first one is that space like, hey, Peter, let me say it again. You, didn't, you got a different definition. I didn't ask if you love me like your brother. I said, do you ask love me like your savior? And he's looking him straight in the eyes. I don't think Peter's making eye contact with him. Shame always makes you look away and you can't even look yourself in the face. Why would you look your savior in the face? Some of you, shame has become a blanket that you go to and it's cathartic and it's self-care trying to keep you in that blanket of shame. Stop it. It's not who you are. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. This would not be the first time Peter would have heard that. He would have heard it earlier in Mark chapter six. I wonder if he would have remembered back to the first time because the first time I couldn't feed them because my hands were filled with offense. Jesus says again, he said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love me. You know that, you know that I love you. Take care of my sheep. Third time, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt. He had the opportunity to be offended. Jesus loved him so much, he's going to take him to his place of offense. <laughs> and 
Jesus is looking him right in the face. Peter's looking at the ground. I believe in my spirit. I see Jesus reaching over and he looks, just touches his chin, lifts it up. Look me in the face. Face your offense. The one you're offended at is still smiling at you. He still loves you. He's not taking his eyes off of you. That's the savior that we serve. He needed Peter to see the offense that he was so, so quickly gone to. Oh, this is beautiful. He said, feed my sheep. Remember when Jesus says, I prayed for you. And when you turn back, when you repent, what are you going to do? You're going to come back and feed your brothers. The first time you didn't have anything in your hands because all you were holding was a fence. But now when you're going back, this time you're going back with something and it's grace. I'm coming back with grace. I'm coming back with grace. Why? Because I was offended at my Savior and yet he still saw me. Ah! Oh! Verse 18. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. And there's a word in there for somebody. You've been doing ministry the way you wanted. You've been doing life the way you wanted. You were worried about picking out your clothes and what you look like. Jesus, I still love you. But then he continues because he loved Peter so much. He says, but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and Someone else will dress you and lead you to where you don't want to go. And the only way that you're able to do that is to deny yourself. I needed to upgrade your definition, Peter. I needed to get you to face your offense. But now I needed to teach you that denying yourself is not a one-time event. It is a lifestyle. It is a lifestyle. So God sent me on assignment. He gave me this sermon back in January. I've not preached it anywhere. He said, hold it for Art Canada. And I was faithful with it. But will you be faithful with the seed that he brought into your heart today? What he's looking for is not for you to honor you, honor him with, his, with your lips, but to honor him with your hearts. This is a word that demands a response. What is something you need to redefine? Maybe it's marriage. The word love, what it means. I don't know. What, what do you need to redefine? What's the offense that you need to face? What's the thing that you've been feeding that God said, I need you to deny? You can't feed them when you're feeding yourself. Because when you go back, Peter, I need you to feed your brothers. Because I love them so much. How do you find rest? It's connected to purpose, not pace. I think Peter got it when he's sitting on the shore and he realized the opportunity that he had with the hills filled with 5,000 men plus the women and children. He missed it the first time. He didn't see the purpose. He saw inconvenience. Because that's not the picture of rest that I thought I want. But those who refresh others, will they themselves be refreshed? You want rest? It's always connected to purpose. Father, I thank you for your word. It's true, it's right, it's infallible, it's inerrant, and it's profitable. And I declare that everywhere it goes forth, it will accomplish what you send it forth to do, and it will not return to you void. I declare that these men and women are good soil, and this is good seed. May the good seed plant in the hearts, but produce a harvest of righteousness. I pray for a spirit of repentance. Oh, I pray for a spirit of contrite heart. I pray for radical conversations of people saying, oh, would you please forgive me? I've been offended at you. Upgrade our vocabulary. May it etched in our heart in such a way that we would not settle with the definitions the world has given us for what success is or what being a man is or being in ministry is. But may we choose to believe your definitions. Give us the discipline of dying to ourselves so that we could live for you so that we could live for your glory, so that many would call upon the name of Jesus. And the pattern of how you walked with Peter is how you're walking with every one of them in here right now. I pray that they would feel the grace of a loving Savior, looking him right in the eyes, leaning forward, grabbing him by the chin, and just lifting it up so that they would see you face to face.
and hear you calling us a friend of God. We love you, Jesus. It's in your precious and mighty name. Everybody said, amen. Amen.